And welcome everybody to another edition of the Brody File. We're glad you're with us and we're going to talk about presidential politics. We've got a lot to talk about. We'll do it in a moment. First though, Brussels, Belgium. You know the deal. Radical Islamic terrorism strikes again. Those are three words that President Obama, this Obama administration cannot say. Hillary Clinton can't say it. Neither can Bernie Sanders. But it has struck again. ISIS responsible, dozens killed, hundreds injured. And once again, we are seeing this all over the world. This time, obviously, in Brussels, at the metro, at an airport. Innocent bystanders senselessly murdered in cold blood. More on Brussels and some of the reaction from Ted Cruz, Donald Trump, and others later in the show. First, though, presidential politics. And boy, oh boy, do we have a race on our hands. Donald Trump has a chance to secure the nomination if he plays his cards right and can barely possibly get to the 1237 that he needs, those delegates that he needs. Uh, and he did well in Arizona. 58 delegates uh, that Donald Trump secured. He won the whole state. It's a winner-take-all state. But Ted Cruz, boy, I tell you what, 40 delegates. He won them all in Utah because he won way over 50 percent of the vote. And if you can win over 50 percent of the vote in Utah, you win all the delegates. So he did it. So in essence, you've got Trump at 58. You've got Ted Cruz at 40 in terms of uh, the last delegate hall, which is a plus 18 for Donald Trump. Still puts him on a path to getting that 1237, but there is very little margin for error for Donald Trump. Now look, as for Ted Cruz, this is the guy, the constitutional conservative guy that the GOP establishment cannot stand. Well, guess what? They've got a problem, and that's because he's pretty much the last guy standing. Yeah, John Kasich is around, but uh, newsflash, third place and a distant third place. Ted Cruz is really the guy that can knock off Trump. And so, so along comes Jeb Bush, and guess what? Jeb Bush, the prototype for the GOP establishment, endorses Ted Cruz. Here's the quote. Ted is a consistent principal conservative who has demonstrated the ability to, pe- to appeal to voters and win primary contests. For the sake of our party and country, we must move to overcome the divisiveness, or is it divisiveness, I don't know, and vulgarity Donald Trump has brought into the political arena. Or we will certainly lose our chance to defeat the Democratic nominee and reverse President Obama's failed policies. It is fascinating to see... Jeb Bush endorsed Ted Cruz, Mitt Romney to vote for Ted Cruz in Utah. These are, look, Ted Cruz is the guy they couldn't stand. And now he's their last best hope to defeat Donald Trump. Fascinating. Hey, look, speaking of presidential politics, boy, uh, we've not only got to talk about the candidates, we've got to talk about the candidates' wives. This thing is going in the gutter so fa- It's already in the gutter. It's now really in the sewer because it's time for the latest soap opera installment of The GOP and the Restless. Well, there she is. She could be the first lady of the United States, Melania Trump, and the Make America Awesome anti-Trump pack put out this big ad basically saying that Melania Trump could be the first lady and do you really want her because she's got she's done some pictures that might be a bit provocative anyhow uh, Donald Trump was not happy he thought the Ted Cruz campaign put it out so he put up this tweet quote lion Ted Cruz I just like to say it like that because you know he's saying it like that lion Ted Cruz just used a picture of Melania from a GQ shoot in his ad be careful lion Ted or I will spill the beans. Why am I selling an accent? I will spill the beans on your wife. Ooh. By the way, let's let the record reflect. Ted Cruz's campaign did not put that out. Once again, an anti-Trump pack put it out. But what is Trump talking about? Spilling the beans on Heidi Cruz versus Melania Trump? Oh my! I need an Excedrin. So, do we, have, Steve? Do we have an Excedrin? Sure. Steve Jacoby with the Excedrin on hand. All right, speaking of a potential Excedrin moment for Donald Trump, boy, he was in front of AIPAC. You know, this is the big pro-Israel group uh, there at the Verizon Center in D.C. This was a big moment for him. If he had failed, it was going to give him a big headache and all of his Trump supporters because he had to do well, especially because he had talked about being neutral between the Palestinians and Israel. Anyhow, he and along with uh, a lot of the other GOP candidates, Hillary Clinton, everybody at APAC, we were there. Have a look. I pledge to use. 
The Big Pro Israel Conference always attracts a bipartisan Tier A list of political bigwigs looking to show their solidarity with Israel. Presidential candidate Hillary Clinton is one of them. Palestinian leaders need to stop inciting violence, stop celebrating terrorists as martyrs, and stop paying rewards to their families. While Hillary Clinton showed up at AIPAC here in Washington, Bernie Sanders did not. But the real big event was those three Republican candidates on stage, specifically Donald Trump, who had some work to do in front of a pro-Israeli audience. Trump has been under criticism for saying that as president, he wants to be seen as neutral when trying to negotiate a potential peace deal between Israel and the Palestinians. His main challenger, Ted Cruz, tried to hit him on that. Let me be very, very clear. As president, I will not be neutral. America will stand unapologetically with the nation of Israel. But Trump's remarks were anything but neutral. In a crucial speech where he read off a teleprompter for the first time, Trump delivered an over-the-top pro-Israel address. I speak to you today as a lifelong supporter and true friend of Israel. The Palestinians must come to the table knowing that the bond between the United States and Israel is absolutely, totally unbreakable. And they must come to the table willing to accept that Israel is a Jewish state and it will forever exist as a Jewish state. John Kasich, who's a distant third in this presidential race, didn't go after Trump. Instead, he played the leadership card. As the candidate in this race with the deepest and most far-reaching foreign policy and national security experience, ladies and gentlemen, I don't need on-the-job training. Beyond presidential politics, the conference's main goal is to get participants active on issues that matter to Israel. Among the key concerns is the growing anti-Israel BDS movement. It stands for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. The movement is trying to economically isolate Israel from other countries in various ways because of their so-called occupation of Palestinian land. CBN was on hand at the conference trying to do their part to help. CEO Gordon Robertson presented CBN's new documentary. It's called The Hope, The Rebirth of Israel. It explains what happened in the 50 years leading up to the founding of the modern state of Israel. And the purpose of the documentary is significant. The more I got into it, uh, the more I decided that uh, the world needed to see this and needed to be educated, particularly in light of what is currently going on with the BDS movement uh, to try to boycott Israel. The more people are educated on how Israel actually came to be, what are the historical facts, uh, the better able they are to argue against BDS. There's no doubt Israel needs America's support, especially after a tense relationship with the Obama administration. So now these tens of thousands pro-Israel supporters here in Washington are looking for a new president who will stand stronger with Israel than ever before. Donald Trump actually doing very well in front of a huge crowd. He was on prompter. Wow, Trump on prompter, amazing. Uh, speaking of Donald Trump in Israel, you know, I moderated a forum down at Regent University. Right, CBN sponsored it, of course. And boy, I, I had a chance to ask him as a moderator about the issue or the topic of Israel. Have a look. Support of Israel, essential for continuing stability in the Middle East obviously, and for maintaining a firm stance against terrorism, will you emphatically stand with Israel? Yes. Is the question. Very simple answer. But yes. <laughs> they've, they've been our most reliable ally, especially in the Middle East. And you look at, you know, what's happened with Israel. They were so against this horrible Iran deal. They were so against it. And I tell you what, Obama was the worst thing that's ever happened to Israel. Mm -hmm. You can look at it as he's not a good president and he's not doing a good job. And you look at uh, Bibi Netanyahu, you look at what he has gone through. I mean, you could just see the level of exasperation on that man's face, how they just, mm -hmm. the most basic things, they weren't winning anything. Why did we make a deal like this with these people? And they look at us like, they have no respect for us whatsoever. They can't believe themselves that they were able to get this deal. I don't get it. I mean, I don't get it. There are a lot of theories out there, but I don't get it. This will be studied and studied for a long time. 
And this will prove to be a very bad deal. This will lead to nuclear proliferation 100 percent. And all the money we gave, everything we gave, even the keeping of the hostages, and, you know, ultimately they released the hostages for $150 billion they released, so it really looks like ransom. The other way, it wouldn't have been ransom, the way I said it, and it would have been back four years earlier. No, I'm with Israel 100 percent. Donald Trump down at Regent University. All right, when we come back, genocide overseas, Christians being persecuted. Jennifer Wishon with the details next. And welcome back, everybody, to The Brody File. All right, look, we know what's going on overseas, Christians and genocide. It's been happening for a very, very long time. The Obama administration has never used the word genocide when it comes to ISIS killing Christians overseas. Well, that has now changed. Jennifer Wishon, Jenny in the B Block, has the story. Pushing it right up to the deadline set by Congress, Secretary of State John Kerry said the words Christians and others waited to hear. In my judgment, Daesh is responsible for genocide against groups in areas under its control, including Yazidis, Christians, and Shia Muslims. It's a critical first step towards protecting Christians from ISIS and other Islamic radicals in Iraq and Syria. Every jihadist in the Middle East believes they can kill, kidnap, enslave, and otherwise torture Christians and other religious minorities, and they believe they can do it without repercussions. In northern Iraq, Assyrian Christians are an ancient people descended from the first followers of Christ. We are, as Assyrians of the Middle East, are we are on the verge of extinction. Juliana Tamarazi recently visited the town of Telescoff in the Nivea plains of Iraq, where 200,000 Christians have fled from ISIS. The homes are destroyed. Uh, they're ran inside. When you walk inside, uh, their closets are all broken, the beds are all overturned. The kitchens are destroyed. Secretary Kerry's genocide designation helps keep the plight of these Christians near the front of U.S. foreign policy. Advocates wasted no time celebrating. They're already working with the State Department to make sure Christians are represented in Syrian peace talks and that the property rights of Iraqi Christians forced to flee their homes are enforced. There are going to be borders redrawn, constitutions redrafted. It's absolutely essential that the Christians have a voice in this process or they will have no place in the new Syria and in the new Iraq. There's already an effort to create a safe haven in the Nineveh Plains so that Christians, Yazidis and other minorities can return home, govern themselves and rebuild their lives without fear of extermination. If you care about the presence of Christianity, the Christian witness in this very gospel poor part of the world, you will support the idea of a safe haven. In spite of the horrors they've experienced at the hands of ISIS, Christians in this part of the world are experiencing a revival of their faith. They have told me repeatedly, it is because of persecution that has been inflicted on them, that they have, been, that they have grown closer to Christ, that they find themselves praying more, that they, they're thirsty for the gospel more. Now the same advocates who pushed for the genocide designation are moving to keep up the pressure to ensure the Obama administration not only talks, but acts to protect those persecuted Christians and other religious minorities. They hope to make real progress before the next administration moves into the White House. For The Brody File, I'm Jennifer Wishon. Jennifer Wishon, thanks Jenny. All right, when we come back, we're gonna talk about Brussels again and how it is influencing presidential politics. It is, back in a moment. And welcome back everybody to The Brody File. All right, as we mentioned at the top of the show, Brussels, Belgium, the big story, radical Islamic terrorism, Hillary Clinton talking about how we'll defeat it and generic, generic, generic. Donald Trump and Ted Cruz getting a bit more specific, especially when it comes to cracking down on what they say is a problem within the Muslim community. Have a look at, at uh, Donald Trump first. I've been talking about this for a long time and look at Brussels. Brussels was a beautiful city, a beautiful place with zero crime, and now it's a disaster city. It's a total disaster. Mr. Trump, and, sorry, and we have to be very, We have to be very careful in the United States. We have to be very, very vigilant as to who we allow into this country. If you do become president and we're in a situation like this, what would you do to protect America? Well, again, I think I've said it. I would, I would close up our borders to people until we figure out what is going on. Look, what, look at Brussels. Look at Paris. Look at so many cities that were great cities. Paris is, is almost, almost as bad 
uh, if you look at, you know, Paris is no longer the beautiful city of lights. Paris has got a lot of problems in it. And all you have to do is speak to the people that live there. And you look at other places where the same thing has happened, and they're in fear. Their city's in fear. And we have to be smart in the United States. Donald Trump with some pretty strong words. Speaking of strong words, Ted Cruz, my goodness gracious, talking about taking a look at law enforcement techniques when it comes to the Muslim community, monitoring the Muslim community in America. He's coming under some criticism. Have a look. New York City, under, under Mayor Bloomberg, had a program that focused on, worked proactively with the Muslim community to stop radicalization, to prevent attacks from radical Islamic terrorism before they occur. Now, what happened? Mayor de Blasio came in and decided political correctness mattered more than keeping people safe. He disbanded the program. Let me give an example. If, if you're concerned with gang violence, gang violence is a real problem in a lot of places across the country. What does law enforcement do with proactive policing? You go into the neighborhoods where gang violence is a problem and you work proactively to get the gang members off the street. And by the way, the people you're protecting are the residents of those communities who are typically the victims with gang violence. It is often African-Americans and Hispanics. It's low-income Americans who are often the victims of those violence. And by having a, a serious police presence there, you are protecting those communities. The same is true in the Muslim community, where radical Islamic terrorists, they don't just murder Christians and Jews, they murder other Muslims as well. And we need to fight and defeat radical Islam. Senator, terrorists. you know that surveillance program was in effect in New York. It has been disbanded, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. You also know it didn't lead to any leads, any intelligence tips. They said it didn't work. It well, it, it is true that the de Blasio political henchmen say that. And it's also true that the NYPD said it provided valuable intelligence. And I'll tell you, as I travel the city of New York and as I travel the country, police officers over and over again stop me and they say, thank you for standing up and having my back. Ted Cruz, some strong remarks, uh, surely to get more traction in the days ahead. All right, when we come back, John Jessup, hey, what do you know? He's here. He's going to review the passion, Tyler Perry's new movie. Well, it's kind of produced by Tyler Perry. It, look, we have a lot of explaining to do. And by the way, the passion is not the Brody Files desire to go through the Taco Bell drive-thru. More in a moment. And welcome back, everybody, to the Brody File. All right, time now to discuss the passion. And we're not talking about the Brody File at the buffet. Instead, it's John's Movie Corner. Here he is. Look, he's right here. John Jessup. I'm back. <laughs> You're back? Where have you been? Uh, I thought it was banned. Oh, well, we thought it was <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for bringing me back. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Likewise. Uh, uh, the Passion. All right, full, dis full disclosure. I haven't seen it. I'll, I'll admit, I'm going to YouTube. I'll figure it out. But give it, give it to me, because I might not go see it if, you, if you're going to give me this you review. You need to pray for penance. Okay, so <laughs> What's the deal? Let, me, let me tell you, uh, critics gave it uh, a mixed bag of reviews. Uh, some described it as bland. Some said it was kind of like a part sermon, part Super Bowl halftime show. One even described it as a musical Jesus-themed jukebox. Uh, I'll leave that, those type of assessments to the paid professionals. I think uh, among social media, overall, with the general public audience, it was pretty well received. Uh, for those who actually stuck with it and watched it all the way through, uh, it clearly struck a nerve. You know, it was a star-studded performance. Uh, they, they delivered strong performances. Uh, the music that kind of resonated with today's audience. Um, but whenever you saw these wide, these sweeping wide pans of the audience, you saw the crowd reacting, especially at times like where the giant illuminated cross finally made its way through the streets of Jerusalem, uh, not Jerusalem, uh, modern day New Orleans. Uh, you saw it when Tyler Perry spoke off the cuff about the, 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 the death and the resurrection of Jesus. The crowd was reacting. You saw people with tears in their eyes and it kind of felt like a little bit of a church service. So I think Gauging off of that, um, again, a mixed bag, but I think for the most part, general audiences really enjoyed it. What's the deal? New Orleans, okay, this ain't, this ain't uh, Jerusalem. Right. So how did that kind of, did you have to suspend reality a little bit here? Yes, you definitely have to go in with a mindset of recognizing that this is not your traditional story of Jesus. It's, it's, it's the greatest story ever told in a refreshed or rethought way using New Orleans as a modern day backdrop. Uh, it incorporates contemporary music that we're, uh, today's audiences are probably more familiar with. And I think the, the goal here is to make them perhaps more likely to connect to the story of Jesus' passion, his, his suffering and his death, uh, more so than the classics like uh, Frank, uh, 
I'm forgetting his name at the moment, but uh, the, the Italian director's um, film, Jesus of Nazareth, or, oh, yeah. or more so than Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner and Cecil B. DeMille's, you know, The Ten Commandments. So it's a, it's a fresh take. There are going to be detractors out there who are probably uncomfortable with changing the narrative and the setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what helped put me at ease and watching the, the production was that they, they didn't change any of the character dialogue. All the dialogue stayed true to the That's biblical account. So that was interesting. And you know, the other thing that I would add is simply this, is uh, that even though it is our story as believers, as Christians, uh, it's not necessarily our story to keep to ourselves. It's our story that we're compelled to share with others um, so that we can hopefully get them to, to enjoy it and love it and tell it as much as we do. Very nice, sir. Passionate about the passion. I don't <laughs> you know. Can say that. I just wanted to say it. Yeah. Great to see you. Thank you for having me on. All right. Back in a. Where am I going? I'm right here. Back in a moment with some final thoughts on <laughs> Donald Trump. Welcome back, everybody, to the Brody File. Hey, look, so you know when you go to rent an apartment, you can expect a few rules. I mean, no smoking in the house, for example, no pets allowed. But our oy vey moment of the week really trumps them all. Meet Mark Holmes, the Colorado landlord. He touts a two bedroom apartment. Dogs are allowed, but Trump supporters are not. That's right, you heard me right there on the ad. It says, if voting for Trump, don't even bother. Don't even bother calling. Well, as you can imagine, there was quite a bit of pushback, especially from Trump supporters. I'm voting for Donald Trump. Uh, your answer is that you don't want Trump supporters, right? That's correct. No, I don't allow them. Anybody that subscribes to his philosophies and to the kind of uh, uh, information that he's spewing and, and the way he spews it, I don't want around me. Like a vault. I mean, seriously? Rental ads with political caveats? This campaign season has officially touched every aspect of our lives, ladies and gentlemen, and we haven't even reached the conventions. We need that Excedrin. Steve, you have the Excedrin, yes? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Steve has the Excedrin. And also he has a prayer or two because we're going to need that, especially when we get to Cleveland and the convention hot in Cleveland. Moy Gavolt. That does it for this week. God bless. Have a great week.